Hi, I'm Mimi Gerges. The film called Our Last Stand follows the trip of an Assyrian Christian American back to the homeland to document the plight of Christians in Iraq and Syria. They are going to destroy our bodies, but not our souls. Welcome to the Mimi Gerges Show. Helma Adi is a school teacher in New York and an American of Assyrian Christian descent. In the summer of 2015, she traveled to Iraq and Syria to visit the indigenous Christians of that region, the victims, the heroes, and those just holding on. The trip is documented in a film called Our Last Stand. It's directed and produced by Jordan Allett. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Jordan, um, what was the impetus behind this film? Well, over the last couple of years, I had done work with an organization based here in Washington, D.C., called In Defense of Christians, IDC, and their focus is on advocating on behalf of Middle Eastern Christians. And so part of advocacy, of course, is building, creating awareness. And I had traveled to the region, to Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Egypt, and learned more about, about what was going on there, um, shot a lot of video, did some writing. But the whole time, I, I knew I wanted to film a documentary. But I was looking for an ideal sort of bridge or face to help bring the story to the West, to Americans. And, and you connect. found Helma's face. <laughs> exactly. And uh, you know, it was perfect because she's a school teacher in New York, uh, born in the United States, but very connected to her, uh, her ancestries and so her Syrian roots. And so I knew once I met her that she, if she was willing to go, it would, she would be the perfect bridge between the two communities. So how did you feel about this idea? Um, well, I remember when Jordan was describing um, this project that he had in mind. We were actually on the phone, and he mentioned that he wanted to go to Iraq and Syria. And um, before he even invited me on the trip, I immediately felt this pang of jealousy, to be honest, because I thought, you know, I had been to the, to the homeland once before, you know, 16 years ago. I had always planned on going back. I never had the chance. And with everything that's happening now, I might never get that opportunity. And I thought, wow, he's going to go visit um, my homeland and, and possibly see my family there, and I won't even have that chance, you know. And I said that out loud to him. I said, you know what, that makes me a little jealous. And that's when he said, well, I think you should come. You know, I want you to be the face here, and, and I want you to tell the story. You first went to Erbil in northern Iraq, and you met with people that had fled the Nineveh Plain area. What did they tell you about that day that they left, and what were the circumstances? I, I don't even know where to begin. We had we heard so many, I mean, heart-wrenching stories. And we spoke to the elderly that told us that, uh, you know, they basically fled with, with the clothes on their back, you know. And then we spoke to mothers that said we had to just run back in the house so that it, at least we could have some milk for, for little babies on the ride, you know. We spoke to a mother that said that when they were stopped, they were forced to get out of their car, they were questioned, they had to present their IDs, and somebody actually held a gun to her head while she was fumbling through her bag to, to present them with the IDs and the things that they were asking for. Um, and we also spoke to children, you know, that were telling us why they had to flee. You know, I asked one boy how they made it out, and he said, well, my parents found somebody that let us jump into their car, which was basically a van that was holding gasoline tanks and they actually piled all the kids on top of this just so that they could make it out you know so I mean there was one heart-wrenching story after another and they left in such a rush because they were told that ISIS was coming and that you will all be killed if you're still here well there was definitely several days of bombing you know one of the boys told us that a bomb fell right in front of their house and um, a young girl next door had passed away um, and that's when his family decided that they had to get out as soon as possible. So there were things that were taking place. And then they kept hearing that ISIS was approaching and that ISIS would be here soon. And so everybody just decided that they had to get out as soon as possible. You met the Yusuf family, and their youngest daughter was kidnapped. Yes. What's their story? Well, their family, um, which was a large family, um, was all heading out. You know, they were one of the families that had to flee uh, at the last minute. She was married. She didn't have any children. 
Um, so she was in a car with her husband and some other family members, and, and if they were following other bands of people all kind of heading through this traffic, all trying to get out at the same time. And they also got to a checkpoint, and everybody was told to get out of their cars. Um, the women were, were put in one group. The men were put, placed in another group. Um, she got placed with a group of women that were all just taken. They were put in another vehicle and taken away, and no one had heard from them. To be sex slaves yeah. in the slave market. Nobody knows. They did hear from her, and her captors said, give us ransom. And they paid $30,000 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and never heard back. Yeah, I mean, we actually heard more than one story that is similar. Um, people are asking for ransom, and they're giving this money, and then they're never hearing from the captors again, and they're not getting their family members back. Things got really bad for uh, Christians in 2006 when the sectarian war mm -hmm. started in Iraq. That was between Sunnis and Shias. Why were the Christians involved in that? You'll see in the film, um, at the time, people started identifying um, by their religion. And so Christians were, you know, definitely pointed out, um, and then they started being targeted. As we know, sort of the history of the world, unfortunately, that minorities are always going to be targeted first, um, whether it's religious or ethnic um, or racial minorities. And, and in this part of the world especially, it's very much more tribal in that way. And, you know, a lot of times people, both in Iraq and Syria, might look at Christians and say, well, they're, they're with, you know, the other group. Um, and, and therefore they're going to be targeted because it's, it's a little bit easier to victimize uh, Christians and, and other minorities. I want to ask you both about the children that you met. What was the state of, of the children? You know, they, they talked a lot about their old life, about their, the things that they miss, the friends that they miss, the, the fact that they even missed school, uh, which sometimes you don't hear that from children. but. Uh, when we were there, they had been out for uh, of school, a lot of them, for, for a year. But it w overall, it was th the more we talked to them and, and people in general, you had a sense of hopelessness. So when you go to a refugee camp, you see what they don't have. You see sort of the, the, the impoverished life that they live. But the longer you stay or the more camps that you visit, the more people that you talk to, the more you realize there's a sense of hopelessness. Again, this is a year after they, they fled, and they didn't see uh, a resolution coming. Um, they, they, a lot of them had some sort of the day-to-day, -day, you know, the food coming, things like that, but they didn't see a way. A future. Yeah, a future opportunities to, to either go back or start a new mm -hmm. life, and, and that brought about the hopelessness. And this must have been hard for you, Helma, being a school teacher. Absolutely. Being with kids all the time. Absolutely. I have an easy time connecting with kids, you know, and I wanted to spend a lot of time just asking them questions about their experiences there. And, you know, being two Americans, the students were excited to have us there, and, and I found them following me around, you know, asking me questions. Um, but, you know, we were there a, a year ago, and, and things were still very chaotic at the time. And so a lot of these camps were they didn't have a lot of the basic necessities even, you know, and so these kids were following us around kind of looking for some attention. And I remember um, a group of these boys that knew that I was there to talk to them. They actually started asking me for things. You know, some of them were saying, you know, I was asking them what they're lacking, what do they want? And, and after they named some of the basic things, they started talking like children. And they said, well, like, we don't even have like a soccer ball to play with. Could you get us a soccer ball? You know, just things that we take for granted, yeah. that, that every, everyday kids just want to run out in, into the street and play with. You know, so yeah, I did hear a lot of stories like that, you know, and that was, that was just so touching. Father Douglas Bezzi is a priest in Erbil. His church has taken in hundreds mm -hmm. of refugees. How is he doing that? I mean, where is he housing them? Well, he explained the whole process, to be honest. I mean, from the point when they just knocked on his door one night and he had to basically set up tents out in his churchyard where people were basically sleeping on top of each other to the point where he decided to get organized. Um, he also explained how he made education a priority, and I think that's the big difference um, at his camp when you compare it to all of the other camps, you know? Um, he, he was my favorite character yeah, in the film, I have to really say. Was. <laughs> it, yeah, it he really was. It just very gave you hope. And energy. Yeah, he's very, right, optimistic. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't even like to refer to Marlia as a refugee camp or as people as IDPs, um, just a community. And I think he is a good example of what can happen when you have a plan, which he had, and then those in the international community actually step up and start saying, okay, we're gonna we can send books, we can send aid, we can, we, this is something we can really get behind and it sort of snowballed.
As a teacher, I really enjoyed seeing all the resources Father Bazi and his team made available to the children at Mar Ilia. I believe that in knowledge. If you want to defeat ISIS, offer books to them. I received four books uh, of uh, books from the uh, United States. People, I don't know them, actually. They just sent me books. He really does focus on children and education. Yeah, yeah and, as he's, and, and I think that's sort of a subtle sort of empowerment of women message, if you mm -hmm, remember. Mm -hmm. he, he talks about how he's trying to, to make leaders, especially of, of the young women, the young girls there. And, and yeah, I think he's that's, got this thing where he doesn't let any of the guys play soccer unless there's one female on the team. Right, Absolutely. <laughs> right. they all have to clear off the field and, unless there's at least one, one girl. And the, the girls feel kind of empowered. Uh, by that, but it's, it's, as he said, it's a rule that he set, and so they can't break it. The rule here, it is, they can't play, the boys, at least one girl among them. Before, the girls, they were begging to them to play. Now, they have to beg to the girls to play, yes, so they will not play. Are you going to play? Rule is rule. Nidam nidam. Yimshi al kul. But in this way, girl, they will feel they are strong. And here, the girls actually, uh, you know, has a right to select which which player they want. If they don't want anyone, go out. And this way, they will they will take care about girls, and the girls they will feel, you know, strong. Yeah. He does have a clear system in place, and when we were uh, going through all of the different footage from uh, from our trip, we were wondering if we should include that whole scene because it is a little bit more upbeat than the rest of the film, you know. But we thought um, it, it it shows, like you said, it really shows what a little bit of creativity, ingenuity, and a lot of outside aid can do for a community that's struggling like that. And that's really why we chose to put it in there. And I, and I think yeah. people in the West too, they can really identify with all the, the different characters. But I think Father Bazi too, he's, you know, he obviously speaks English and he, he's, he's kind of happy-go-lucky. Mm -hmm. He's very courageous. His backstory is very, very interesting, which we didn't get to go into. But um, I, I think he would really, his sense of humor is something that lightens the mood and, and makes people watching it realize these are just like friends and family members of mine. Mm -hmm. They're just in a very difficult situation. What do they want? Do they want to resettle in the West? Do they want to go home? That's <laughs> the the big question. I I think I thought initially when all of this happened, and even when I went to go visit, that like a lot of people in the West, a lot of Americans would think, well, let's just get them out of there. It seems like the natural thing to do. We want to help. They can come to, to Europe or elsewhere or even the United States and, and live freely and have opportunities, and, and they can be and just have a future. And, yeah, exactly. So that makes sense on the surface. But the, m the deeper we went, you know, f not just to refugee camps, but into n other places in Iraq and then into Syria, meeting with, with all types of people, we, we realized a lot of them aren't going to leave because this is where they've, they've lived for thousands of years. Their ancestors have been yeah. and suffered and sort of the blood is in the, in the, in the, in the soil yeah. uh, in these countries. And also, we, I learned more and more about the important role that, that Christians play in this part of the world. They've had, a, and if, if all of them leave, which is what the extremists want, there's a reason why they want that. It's, it's going to be a lot easier to radicalize the next generation um, for groups like ISIS when there aren't positive Christian influences there. Yeah. And you know, just to speak to that, um, and, and meeting different people and, and hearing their stories and, and, and hearing them tell us what they want, it really helped us understand what really is important to survival out there. You know, we met people um, in parts of the Nineveh Plains that have been in those areas f for centuries, and they're really rooted in that soil. And what was important for them was this strong sense of, of identity and staying in your homeland, you know? Um, and then you met people in some of the refugee camps um, that wanted to leave because they had family members that had already immigrated to Europe and, um, and, and they couldn't even provide the basic necessities, you know, living in the, those refugee camps. But then you went to Syria and when we stayed with my aunt, who actually can go live in Europe, I mean, she has um, several children living in Germany and Sweden, but she chooses to stay in Qamishli, in Syria, because what's important to her is to be able to go to church every day, to be able to socialize with her neighbors, to be the able community. to continue living that mm. simple life that she so loves. Saddam. 
يعني بصراحه كنا يعني هم ما كنا مرتاحين ما كنا بس ما كان بس ما كان يعني فد مره يعني بس ورا السقوط يعني ظهرت يعني ظهر انت مسيحي اني انت انت سني انت شيعي انت انت يزيدي ظهرت هاي الطائفيه يعني على كان موجود هو بس كان بشكل بسيط يعني كان عشنا قلنا ما نطلع احنا هذا بلدنا باقيين بلدنا كنائسنا احنا ما نعرف كنيستنا ما نعرف اديرتنا ما نعرف مكان احنا ولدنا ولدنا بيه وعشنا بيه احنا ما نعرفه احنا باقيين There's a village called El Kush and you met the Nineveh Plain Protection Units. Mm -hmm. Now, who are they and how are they being funded? They are a militia that um, when ISIS came in originally, they felt like they weren't being protected by either the Iraqi military or the, the Kurdish military. And they decided, well, this, we need to defend our own territories ourselves because no one is doing it for us. And so... But where are they getting weapons and things like that? They're, they're getting aid. Um, you know, I, I don't know all the specifics on you know where everything's coming from, especially now since it's been a year since we were there. But they're getting aid from outside organizations, mm -hmm. international community that, that understood their need, and I think slowly they they got more and more uh, aid, and now they're starting to participate with hopefully in the in, in the near future the freeing of the towns around and mm -hmm. including Mosul, mm -hmm. which is ultimately what they want. But it hopefully will will, will happen uh, in, the, in the coming months. Helma, you spoke to a Yazidi woman. Yes. What did she tell you? She described her experience um, from the time that her village, Sinjar, was attacked um, by ISIS. She explained how um, all of the men were rounded up and basically separated from all of the women, uh, never to be seen again. She was pregnant at the time when she was kidnapped, and she told us that you know the group of girls that she was uh, with were taken to the school that they called the School of Death. She told us what happened to her during the time that she was there. And then she explained to us how the first chance that she got, she was able to escape, and how she traveled through mountains for six days trying to, to take sips of this bottle of water that she had with her, and how she eventually made it back and was reunited with her family. Her husband is still, you know, missing, assumed dead. Um, she was able to give birth to this child that she now has, but she did tell us that she still has several member, family members missing, and she, and she asked us to help bring everybody back because there are still so many girls that are captive and men that are missing. You guys crossed into Syria, and uh, not to state the obvious, but isn't that really dangerous? Yeah. Yes, um, I would say, <laughs> people say that. I've been there twice in the last couple of years, and getting in in different ways, but I always say you can cut down on the, the danger factor um, by half if you do your homework yeah. and you trust in the right people. And so, mm -hmm. for example, um, we, we were taken all throughout northern Iraq by uh, Christian militias, and then we were picked up in, in Syria by the Syriac Military Council, MFS, which is a um, Syriac Christian militia. And that is, is very important to have those contacts and those people um, that you can trust in. And so it is still dangerous, obviously, because mm -hmm. we talked about some of the ransoms that um, you know, Christians are and, and others like Yazidis are forced to pay. Obviously, a Ameri couple of Americans would, would uh, help fund ISIS um, for, for, for quite, a, quite a long time. So you have to be careful, but if you do your homework, you plan ahead, and you trust in the right people, you can cut down on, on, on the you know, safety concerns. So let me ask you about the MFS. Now, this is another Christian militia. Mm -hmm. um, they are not just fighting ISIS, they're also fighting uh, other groups like um, the Nusra Front, mm -hmm. which is Al Qaeda. Are they just a defensive force? Are they protecting neighborhoods? Or are they actually offensive? Well, they're trying to take back towns and, and areas that. Um, that are currently under ISIS control. Right. For example, we visited uh, a number of villages in the Khabur region, and they helped to retake some of those villages that had been taken over by ISIS. And you know, so they are defensive in, in some ways, but they're also trying to take back areas that were taken uh, over by ISIS and other extremist groups. And Helma, what was your feeling when you were with them? I mean, are these uh, seriously? Are they just a ragtag bunch I of guys like that pick up out, a rifle? No, I felt like I was hanging out with my brothers and my cousins. Honestly, you know, we were all speaking Syriac. Um, they were telling me their backstories. I mean, the, uh, their spokes 
person, uh, Kino Gabriel. He has such an interesting story. He's a young man. I mean, he's 25 years old. He's the same age as my sister who just finished college, you know? Um, but he, he told me that he was in Aleppo. He was in dental school. So he had, he had a bright future ahead of him. I mean, he was set. Um, and, and, and when everything sort of started falling apart in Syria, you know, he, he got involved. He came back to Qamishli and he saw the need to, to pick up arms and defend the Christians that are in Qamishli because really there was nobody else around to, to help defend them. You know, he saw people start leaving. He didn't want Qamishli to be emptied out of the Christians that have been there for, uh, you know, for generations. And so he basically gave up everything to, to protect those people. Yeah, and I mean, that this MFS is very, um, I have a lot of respect for them. They're relatively large um, for a Christian militia, mm -hmm. 12, mm -hmm. 1,300 men, which might not seem like a lot, but they've, they've grown quite a bit. They've suffered about 20, 25 martyrs, 25 people that have been killed over the last two, two years, two and a half years, I think. And so um, they're definitely, you know, they're, they're still getting going and getting experience, but they're uh, definitely helping in, in getting rid of ISIS uh, in that part of the country. There's a Christian village named Hasaka that was completely destroyed. What did you see there? Well, Hasaka was, when we went there, it was partly controlled by ISIS and Assad had, had control of it. And then this group that included um, the Kurds and others and, and the Christian militia, MFS, were sort of fighting over this, this city, which is a relatively large city. Um, in, in northeast Syria. And when we were there, they, they had plans to basically eliminate mm -hmm. ISIS from the area, they said in about two weeks. And I don't know if we were skeptical, but we wondered how it would go. And, and it, it did actually happen the way that they, they, they had said it. They, they were for able it. to push yes. them out. Now they're still going back and forth. And, and I think they've been able to keep them at bay to a certain extent, but you never know. Because you know a lot of times we hear in the news, well, ISIS has been driven out of a certain city. Well, that you know, it's sort of like cockroaches, right? They're just going to go to another area where they feel like they have right. opportunities. Now, the the um, the village that we went to, which is right on the outside mm -hmm. of, of Hasaka, which was completely destroyed, is a traditionally uh, an Assyrian, Assyrian village. village right. in it's in the Chabod area. Chabod is an area. It's called Chabod because there's a river there that's named the Chabod River, which now is dried out. But it used to be a very fertile and green and vibrant and colorful area. Um, so there are these, you know, about 35 Assyrian villages, one right after the other. Um, and I had always heard stories about Chabud growing up. I have, you know, um, aunts and uncles that are married to, to people from Chabud. Chabud is right next to Khamishli, which is where my family's from. So, um, you know, before everything happened, you know, Chabud was a place that I, you know, imagine visiting someday, you know. Uh, but when, when we got there, I mean, I just... I, I, I couldn't believe what we saw. I mean, like the church was completely destroyed. It, it was completely destroyed, and that used to be, you know, the pride of its village. Um, you know, there's rubble everywhere. I mean, you can still see traces of what used to be. You know, you see people's doorways adorned with, um, you know, iron crosses or symbols, uh, you know, Assyrian symbols, um, but broken, tattered on the floors. You know, there are statues of the Virgin Mary that would protect their houses are, are you know, broken in, in pieces on the ground. I mean, I remember the very first thing we saw was a, was a, a schoolhouse that I was told, well, I didn't know it was a schoolhouse until I was told because it was, um, it was just a you bunch can't of even rubble. Tell. Yeah. Um, Helma, towards the end of the film, you're with your relatives and um, they say to you, quote, today it's ISIS that kills us. A generation ago, it was the Ottoman Empire. And tomorrow, it will be the next extremist group that targets our Christian community and tries once more to drive us out of our homeland. Is there no end in sight? Well, that's an appeal. That was an appeal to the international community, um, to the people that are going to watch this film, that we finally, we need a solution to this problem. You know, um, my family in particular wants to remain in that homeland and, and, and they want us here to be a voice um, seeking help, asking the international community to, to make it safe for the people that are the indigenous people of those lands to be able to live freely and peacefully in their homeland. Jordan, uh, the screenings have been uh, sold out. Why do you think this film has hit a nerve? I think everybody knows what's going on uh, with ISIS. Everybody's heard of ISIS, but they haven't heard the story of, of, uh, of Christians there. And I think, you know, whether somebody's a Christian or not, they, they, I think they relate with, with what, what, what's going on over there. And I think using Helma as the bridge definitely helped. But to see Christians not just fleeing, um, to see them standing up and, and fighting for their land and their faith and their families is something that, uh, that appeals to people. And when we go and we try to bring uh, these screenings to, to the Christian community, 
I think that they will realize, wow, this is, they, they share my history. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where my faith comes from, this part of the world. And I didn't know that. And so a big part of the film is, is trying to get it to people like me, Americans who are, you know, I'm, I'm Catholic. Who I didn't know a lot about it, the situation, but once I did, I wanted to learn more and I wanted to help. And so that, that's the major goal uh, with our last stand. Uh, just to give you an example, I mean, we had our um, premiere just a couple of weeks ago in New York City, and um, you know, the room was packed from people from all different corners, not just people from the Middle East, not just people that are Christian. I mean, just people that you know have a genuine concern and wanted to come and watch and, and learn about this minority living in, in a certain part of the world. So I had friends from work come join, and as you know, I'm a teacher, and so they were, um, you know, other teacher friends. And as soon as I, you know, got back to work this week, we went back to school. I, I was approached by everybody that was at the movie to ask how they can help. Um, they wanted to know where they could donate. They wanted to know if they should be writing letters to their local congressman. I even had a teacher that said we should we should you know start a book drive and send these books to those kids in those refugee camps. So people do care. They just need to know. It's, it's really all, just about raising awareness. <laughs> Thank you both so much for being on the program. Thank you. Thank you. This has been the Mimi Gerga Show. You can see all of our programs on whut.org and YouTube. Connect with us on Facebook and Twitter and leave me your comments there. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join me again next time.